Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you again on behalf of the Atlantic for coming out this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, and I want to welcome General Shanahan thank you. Uh, to uh, our event. Um, we're going to do the entire history of AI in the next four minutes, so <laughs> take out your notepads. Um, the, uh, the general, as all of you know, um, is the director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center uh, in the DOD. And uh, I thought it would be best to start, not assuming anything on the part of anybody here, best to start with a simple question, which is when people in the Pentagon say artificial intelligence, what do they mean? Well, it's one of the challenges. It's like asking economists a question. Ten of them will give you 12 different answers. I think you'll see the same with artificial intelligence. The way I look at it in the most basic, simplest terms, that people will, will argue on the definition, but as a starting point, machines performing at or above the level of human performance. Right now, that's a fairly narrow use case, things like perception, actual language processing, expert systems. But over time, we'll expand beyond perception to reasoning and, and beyond. But in its most basic terms, when we started our Project Maven, it was, I need a machine to perform at least as well as a human, but of course, we're seeking better performance than that. Right. Do, do um, a quick turn on, on Project Maven and how it transmogrified or led to your current center, uh, because I just want to make sure mm -hmm. people understand the recent history of, of all of these efforts. Well, so it, it was driven by an urgency for the Department of Defense that we weren't moving anywhere near fast enough in actually fielding artificial intelligence capabilities. We were criticized from the outside Defense Innovation Board who were seeing what was happening in commercial industry and just, just really hitting the department for not recognizing how fast commercial industry was changing and that the department needed to adopt those practices. So we had a problem. We didn't start with artificial intelligence in search of a problem. Our problem was a basic problem. Intel analysts are sorting through with eyeballs far too much information than they could ever deal with. Uh, 12 hours at a time looking at what we call full motion video. It's very, very excruciating, painful to do that. And you make mistakes, you miss things, you're drinking energy drinks, and it's just not, it's just not conducive to really good decision making. And we knew we were not going to get more analysts. In fact, we assumed the future is we're going to get a reduction in personnel. We saw what was available in DOD, which was terrific research and development, things that were not getting into the hands of warfighters fast enough. We did find that in commercial industry. So we went with a commercial first approach and put together a Pathfinder project to get from research into fielding as rapidly as possible. We showed that to then Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work and almost on the spot he stood us up as the algorithmic warfare cross-functional team, but that's a little hard to say, so we became Project well, Maven. But it was- A little dystopian it, sounding. Yeah, too, it, yeah, well, he, yeah. he envisions a future as, as I do of algorithms versus algorithms, but we can, we can talk about that separately. But it was a fairly basic um, problem set of classifying or detecting classifying tracking objects, people, buildings, vehicles, and those sort of very, very high object classes just to prove proof of concept. And then within four months of standing up, we had uh, four startup companies on contract and then big company on contract and delivered a minimal viable product uh, less than eight, mo eight months after getting stood up, which for the department was incredibly fast. Not nearly fast enough for the software-driven age, but that was our, our starting point. Right, and then bring us to the to the current role. By, by showing that at least as a proof of concept, still a long way to go to show what I would say is the return on investment that we want to see for Project Maven, uh, looking at, uh, say, an industry analogy of about three years from conception to return on investment, but realizing we needed something for the entire department, not just for the intelligence enterprise. How do we learn to do AI adoption and integration and do it fast and do it at scale across the entire department. That required a different organization that was we, last summer was approved as the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Right. Um, talk about your funding for a minute. How much do you have now and how much do you need in order to actually infiltrate AI into every aspect of the DOD? Um, that's a hard question to answer. Yes, I will I tell you what I have now. It's $89 million for this current fiscal year, which is about to uh, uh, run out. Um, we are very well funded in the next fiscal year. About $200 million is, is the number. We will seek additional funding through the course of the next five-year budget cycle to begin to show how important it is to bring this across the entire Department of Defense. This is a little bit of a, of a hard sell sometimes because artificial intelligence in a software-driven age, it's 
hard for me to project out three years from now exactly what projects we're going to be working on. What I'd like to do is be held accountable after the fact for, did you spend your money in the, in the wisest way possible? Did you show that you made the right investments? And where you didn't, did you fail early and stop a project and move on? But the funding is actually very good. It's supported by the Department of Defense, but we also have to fight a little bit to right. see what our budget will be. Right. Talk about the, the, the Project Maven, the, the way it came to the public's attention, I think, was through um, a, a bit of an employee revolt at Google. Um, at, uh, people were, were, some of the workforce were worried about partnering with a Pentagon AI project. Talk about that moment. Um, uh, talk about your relationship with that company and other companies and, and what you're doing to try to, if you're doing anything, to allay those kind of concerns. Yeah, and, I, and I don't want to go too much into the specifics, but it's, uh, as, I was, as I was saying earlier, it's sort of surprising to me and disappointing that somewhere along the way the adjective controversial has been applied in front of Project Maven. It was never controversial to me. We were being very transparent about what we were trying to do, which was intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. No weapons involved whatsoever. This was tr trying to take what humans were spending far too much time and effort in a very, very industrial age way of doing business and make life better for them so they make better and faster decisions. Uh, and then that um, company had some internal uh, dynamics where some employees um, probably didn't fully understand what we were trying to do, so lessons learned on both sides. The idea of being uh, transparent and clear on our objectives and internal to the company, uh, I think in retrospect they've learned some lessons about what they're saying in, inside their own company about the, uh, what they're working with the Department of Defense on. The flip side of that question is can you do the things that you want to achieve for warfighters without the assistance of America's largest tech companies? Well, it's, it would be extremely hard to do it with, without them. And, and when I say it's an ecosystem, it's everybody from a four-person startup in a garage to the biggest companies in the world that do hyperscale commercial cloud and AI. We need all of them um, to be partners with us. So it's the idea of trust, transparency, and collaboration with industry. If you go back to the, to the I don't want to say it's the halcyon days, but the, in the 50s, how we actually got Silicon Valley from the East Coast to the West Coast, it involved this, this, this idea of industry, government, and academia working together in close collaboration. Not always with, with the common objectives, but, but pretty close. What I'm seeking is to bring that back today so that we want to do business with companies that want to do business with us. But that does require a little bit more work on both sides to understand in an environment where we have people that have never worked with a person in uniform before, what are we really trying to achieve with our artificial intelligence? Right. Maybe because um, I'm interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger tomorrow at this festival, um, I have a little bit of Terminator on my mind. When you have these dialogues with people who don't, from your perspective, understand what you're doing, um, what are you hearing back from them? Killer robots? Is that what the anxiety is? Yeah, because, because there is so much hype associated with AI, I, I, as, I, as I say, I'm the practitioner. I have to take the theory and, and the good ideas and turn them into practical projects in the Department of Defense. It is very unhelpful to jump straight to this very far end scenario of Terminator or, or um, Skynet or, or one of these um, very, very uh, far extreme versions of what AI could do if we were in 15, 20, 30, 50, 100 years right. down in the future. What I try to get people to understand is here is actually what we're working on today. And by the way, when we do this in the Department of Defense, we're always going to do it with the ethical, safe, and lawful use of artificial intelligence in mind. If we're going to perform a mission with AI and we can't do it in an ethical and responsible manner, we won't use the AI. It just seems that people don't either appreciate that or understand it. And again, this may be partly our, our fault for not being more transparent and open in what we're trying to do it. Some of the work that you're doing now, um, give two examples. You, you do a lot of work on humanitarian disaster relief, mapping out future natural disasters, um, helicopter maintenance, mm -hmm. predicting parts failures in helicopters. That sounds rather anodyne, but obviously lethality is the main reason for DOD to exist, trying to protect America through the use of weaponry and sometimes killing humans. Uh, as you move toward helping the warfighter directly with maneuvers and fires, for instance, mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate much more anxiety? And what are you doing specifically inside your organization to address ethical issues as they arise? 
Now, and there's a reason we start with the, with the projects you talked about. One is uh, there are lower consequence missions. So if we got something wrong, we'll identify it early and it doesn't have massive consequences for the warfighter. And the, as we learn more and more about how to actually field AI, we'll apply those lessons as we move uh, in the next year to more um, a use of artificial intelligence capabilities for warfighting operations. And why is that? We're trying to give an advantage to the United States, our partners and our allies to make better and faster decisions. And with the way that technology can perform, convinced of this can perform, can help reduce. I will never say eliminate, very dangerous to say eliminate. Combat is a very chaotic, uh, friction filled environment. Not eliminate those, but reduce the risk of the really bad things that can happen right. on a battlefield. Right. Well, let me, uh, the, the fog of war is what you're combating. Right, uh, you're trying to give more information to warfighters in real time so that they can see things that they otherwise wouldn't see. But my question has to do with the decision-making loop. The very purpose of having AI imposed on these systems is to, pr because AI can go faster than, than mm -hmm. humans. We, we talk all the time about always allowing humans to intervene in the system, but isn't that in a way contradictory? Because because the, the, the AI will, the, the very purpose of this is to, is to go faster than humans are capable of going. How do you deal with that contradiction, especially in a war fighting? Yeah, well, in a couple of different ways. First of all, we have policies in place that govern, govern the use of autonomy and weapon systems. And we start from a position of, as I said earlier, the ethical, safe, and lawful use of artificial intelligence. So what does that mean? I think most of us are readily categorize the world into sort of two components autonomy and semi-autonomous systems that may or may not have AI, but an even if they're AI, I put them in one category. Where, where the Terminator scenario uh, comes in is, you might say, independent, unsupervised, self-targeting right. systems. I don't know of any commander I've ever been uh, associated with that wants those systems out making decisions in life or death that they don't have some play into. So when we talk about fielding these systems that are accelerating decision-making, what we're trying to do is get through that, that chaotic piece as fast as possible, reducing the limit of really bad things happening, and give humans more time to think. The cognitive piece, the human-machine teaming is, let the machine do what machines do best, which is get signal out of noise and get through volumes of information very quickly, and let the humans spend a little bit more time so they don't uh, make the mistake about where that weapon goes and, and kills somebody. You mentioned signals out of noise. I, I want to ask you a very quick question, and we're going to have time for a couple of questions, I think. Um, but but uh, Roberta Wolstetter, uh, in, in, in her seminal work on Pearl Harbor, uh, is, is all about signals and noise. All, all the signals were there. It was just cluttered with noise. If you could impose AI back into history 80 years, I mean, it's a little bit of a thought game. Uh, do you think that that Pentagon planners, or there wasn't the Pentagon yet, but, but, but War Department planners would have been able to see things that they didn't see at the time. I mean, the, the goal here is not to be surprised. No, AI I, is supposed to help you not be surprised. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's counterfactuals are, are dicey. And they're, 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 to go back in They're dicey time, in uniform. They're yeah, fun it, for me. Well, they're, they're <laughs> humans are fallible. Um, with, with AI or without AI, humans are fallible. To think that we could never be surprised in, in history again, I won't, I won't even attempt to say that that, right. that is the future. Would enough information have been available through a system that had been trained on lots and lots of data that even as something as simple as Boolean logic, if and logic, you see these patterns of things, then the probability, remember, we're not talking deterministic solutions here, we're talking probability outcomes. The probability of Japan attacking Pearl Harbor is 90% within the next three months. Maybe that would have gotten enough attention. I, 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 I can't pause at that, that scenario. I'm more interested Nobody's in what can it do in the decision. future. All right, nobody's <laughs> holding that. Um, what I want to ask about, before we uh, take a couple of questions, I want to ask about China and Russia. Um, and th there's an ethical component to this because um, one assumes that the Chinese, who are your most direct competitors on this front and many other fronts, mm -hmm. um, are not taking into account, for instance, privacy concerns um, when they're developing uh, these systems. Do they have an advantage over the United States because they're an autocracy and this is a democracy? Do you feel that? If it's an advantage, it might be a short-term advantage. In the long term, an authoritarian uh, regime using AI for purposes of social control, population control, and repression is a long-term strategic disadvantage. Whatever you might say about the United States, its allies and the partners, 
in, their, in our approach to doing things, the transparency we bring to it, our commitment to doing things in an ethical way will never change. Technology changes, our commitment to the ethical employment of technology is not. That gives us a different kind of advantage. It may not be a military advantage on a battlefield uh, by the minute, but I think strategically it does show a difference in our approach to how we bring in AI into our, into our weapon right. systems. Let me take one or two questions. We'll see how fast we can go. Do you want to come right over here? He put his hand up first. It's AI augmented. He got it. <laughs> so I'm a mechanical engineer in Silicon Valley. Um, I perceive a culture of apathy and distrust regarding public service, military, and government there. Uh, I also think that people in Silicon Valley generally don't understand the adversarial nature of the technology competition between countries. How do we instill or reinstill reverence for government and military work in our top engineers? No, thanks for the question. AI.mil should be live this week. We are recruiting. If you're looking for a position, the Jake. <laughs> Well, that was a resume, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Jake is open for business. No, it's, it's, it's actually a really good question. It goes back to what I was, uh, was suggesting earlier, and, and I say Silicon Valley as a broader term for the entire tech industry. We just, we, we have to do a better job of communicating what the threat is doing versus our commitment to doing things in our way of, of working in the United States. And I, I think there's an assumption by people that, uh, say, China and Russia are going down a path of, of uh, least resistance, that there is no problem in terms of how they're going to use their, their capabilities. What I worry about is when do we really learn that lesson? It's when we fight and lose. Now it's too late. So we go back to the idea of being transparent and clear about why this is important to the Department of Defense. It's a much bigger question than the Department of Defense should be answered. It's a societal question that I think we have to be a little bit more invested in our own national security and the implications. I think part of the problem is, honest, honestly, the people developing the tech don't fully understand how it could be used because they're used to it for civilian purposes. What about the military side? And vice versa, the people in the military or in the rest of the government aren't familiar enough with the technology to know what its strengths and sometimes, as I say, most importantly, its limitations can be. So it requires a very, very robust dialogue that has to continue, and I need it to happen so it's not too late by the time we come to a conclusion that we have a way of doing this that is in the long-term interest of our national security. Right. Take one more quick one. Anybody over here, I guess? Just a quick one. What level of security clearance do all of your people require? Uh, began with unclassified, and there was a reason for that when we started Project Maven, because where was the tech? It was in industries where people didn't have security clearances. Over time, it'd be a combination of unclassified, secret, and above, depending on the projects we're working on. But we very deliberately started with unclassified projects for that very reason, to maximize the opportunity to bring in people from the tech industry. Uh, listen, very, very, very good, very quick lightning round here, um, but I think we covered a lot. Thank you all very much for uh, being here. And thank you, General Thank Shannon. you. Thanks very much. Thanks.